Well, hello, everybody. Um, this is Dean Tenney. I'm coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. We started an explication of the various uh, content uh, of the various exams published by either FINRA or NASA. And this is FINRA's uh, content outline for the SIE. We started with section one, and uh, I wasn't sure people would find this useful or not. People did, so we're continuing on with that project. Uh, this is ex uh, section two. This is uh, big time. This is, uh, let me get out my annotation tool. Uh, this is 44% of your exam. And that ends up being uh, 33 questions. So again, the explication isn't to substitute for your study materials and other things we have available for you, right? Uh, as you recall, we have on the channel, the YouTube channel, uh, hours uh, and hours of lectures on the SIE. In fact, I think we have enough sufficient content on the SIE uh, if you watch those lectures, for example, on equity securities embedded in there, there are SIE practice questions for you. And so this is just a kind of an intellectual inventory, if you will. So uh, let's get started. So when you own common stock, when you own common stock, you're an owner of the corporation. And ownership comes with rights and privileges. And as an owner in the business, now let me get a different color, you have the first claim on profits but the last claim in liquidation. So, you know, we have profits. The board will then decide how much of those profits or earnings per share. We may or may not have that to distribute as a dividend, how much to keep as retained earnings to build the business. And you have the uh, risks and rewards of being an owner of a business. And when you own this business, what you're hoping is uh, when you buy a common stock, is you can make money one of two ways. By, that's way, by the way, that's true of all investments. The only two ways you're gonna make money in an investment is income and or price to pre appreciation. Now, if their income stream on the stock would be represented by dividends and some stocks pay dividends and some stocks uh, do not. And if there is no dividend, well, then you'd be an owner in that business, owner of that stock uh, for price appreciation. As I said, uh, you have the first claim on profits, last claim in liquidation. Now we have preferred stock. And when you own preferred stock in a corporation, you have preferential treatment in two areas, uh, dividends. You know, the corporation cannot pay a dividend to its common stockholders and its arrears to the preferred stockholders. Uh, I like to try and put in different colors the things I'm telling you versus the things that are in the content outline. And so you have preferential treatment in uh, dividends. That's why it's called preferred stock. And you have preferential treatment in liquidation. You are second to last in line. Now remember that uh, preferred stock, the dividend is stated as a percentage of par. So for example, if it's a 6% preferred stock, that's based on par. Uh, par would be uh, 100. So if we have a 6% preferred stock, that's based on par, par is $100. So you'd be able to tell me on the test, that'd be whoop, $6 and annual dividend. Uh, you have to be able on the test to contrast rights with warrants. Uh, rights are your right to maintain proportion ownership. It amounts to your first right of refusal on the issuance of new shares. Again, this is not a lecture. It's an explication. You definitely know that warts are short term, excuse me, warrant, uh, rights are short term. And exercisable below with the current market price. CMP means current market price. And you have to be able to contrast those with warrants, which are long-term and exercisable above the current market price. Oh, sorry about that. Didn't get in my different color here. This 
So warrants are long term test question. and exercisable above. American depository sheets, very testable, can best be characterized as foreign securities traded in domestic markets, foreign securities traded in our domestic market, US market. Uh, let's just say on the exam, EDRs can best be characterized as, and one of the major misrepresentations uh, brokers make, whether it's, you know, intentionally or maliciously or ignorantly, you do have foreign currency risk. I mean, if the underlying business is conducted in the foreign currency, you have a foreign currency risk. Uh, very testable to know ownership and liquidation. And as we said, it goes uh, from junior to senior. If we uh, file chapter seven liquidation, or we've choose to liquidate the corporation. It goes uh, common stock, uh, preferred stock, uh, unsecured debt, and secured debt. That would be from junior to senior. You know, the other visa version with this, if you go senior to junior, you have voting rights that stipulate in the corporate charter and the voting rights you will have will either be statutory or cumulative, regular way or block is another way of saying that. So that would be in the thing. Statutory is one uh, on each of the things we'd be voting on, you would have a vote. So if you have 500 shares, you have 500 votes. Uh, and what you gotta be able to do is contrast that with cumulative where we multiply the number of uh, shares you have by the things we're voting on. And cumulative voting protects minority rights, minority shareholders. Again, I'm not lecturing. This is not a replacement for the equity securities lecture, which, you know, no surprise, Dean highly recommends to you. Uh, this is just an explication of the things you're held accountable for, so just an intellectual inventory, so to speak. We have a convertible preferred and we have convertible debt. Convertible preferred, you can switch your status from being a preferred stockholder, from switch your status, from preferred to common. And then what we're really gonna be uh, concerned about there is what's called the conversion ratio. You know, uh, is the conversion ratio two shares of common for every Share I have. Uh, control stock and control persons. Control stock is the stock held. Control stock and control persons. Well, a couple of ways to go here. I guess we'll go with control persons first. Uh, control persons are the, uh, the insiders of the corporation. What that is, is the Officers, directors, and principal stockholders. A principal stockholder, somebody owns more than 10%, and all that stock they own is called control stock. And then remember, they're going to be subject to uh, volume limitations under 144. Now, by the way, that control stock is doesn't matter whether it's unregistered or registered, it's all the stock they own. And it applies to even if it's registered stock, you know, unrestricted, they're still gonna be subject to the volume limitations, which is 1% of the outstanding stock. Or the average of the last four weeks trading volume whichever is greater. And that's every 90 days. And you know, we have great mnemonics for you. Uh, by the way, you file form 144 at or prior. 
to doing that. That form is good for 90 days. Uh, one, four, four, one percent of the outstanding stock, average of the last four weeks trading volume up to four times a year. Uh, we have debt instruments. We're in uh, section, two, uh, section two here. Uh, T-bills are issued a discount. I would know that. By the way, all money market securities are issued a discount except for uh, negotiable jumbo CDs. And they trade at a discount as well. And then uh, notes and bonds and receipts. Uh, the minimum spread there is going to be 30 seconds. They trade in 30 seconds. Um, a treasury receipt is a government version of a zero, either a strip from the US government or one that's been stripped by a, a broker dealer. And so, you know, just don't get hung up on the language there. That treasury receipt would have no income stream and you'd buy it and it would be an imputed interest you're receiving. So uh, we have agency securities. The one they really want you to know is Ginny May on the test, the Government National Mortgage Association. I have a, a little brief uh, uh, lecture on Ginny May. So Ginny May is the one. And Ginny May, unlike the others, has the full faith and credit of the US government. Nothing better than that. I uh, definitely know that. You know, the ones have an implied backing, but a direct backing is uh, much better. They trade based on the average maturity of the uh, mortgages in the portfolio. Uh, that could show up on your exam, on your SIE. You know, we have various types of corporate bonds. The big deal on the test is we have secured corporate bonds and unsecured corporate bonds. And the secured bonds, the equipment trust certificates, the mortgage bonds, the collateral trust bonds are senior in uh, liquidation. And the unsecured bonds, debentures, are junior in liquidation. And then remember, we also have uh, convertible prefer our convertible bonds convertible corporate bonds. And once again, the thing that would be important there is the conversion ratio. We have uh, two types of municipal bonds. Let me move up our thing here. We have two types of convertible uh, municipal bonds. We, oh, there, right there. Good thing I moved it up, right? We have GOs, which are uh, backed by taxing authority. the full faith and credit of the political subdivision. By the way, be careful on the test. Uh, states are municipal issuers of security. So there's 50,000 municipal issuers of securities, 50,000 municipal issuers of securities, 50 of those are states. Um, so just be careful, government on this means US government. So taxing authority, which is their authority to tax whereas revenue bonds are backed by user fees. Again, let me get a different color there. And if the user fees are insufficient, uh, the bonds will uh, default. We have special types of municipal bonds, uh, like uh, special assessment. We have, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, moral obligation bonds. I wouldn't get too in the weeds on your SIE on this, but we also have uh, munis that are money market instruments. Uh, uh, very testable. Other money market securities, these are very testable. So let's get there. Um, I don't know of any draw which are not going to torment you on money market securities. So first thing is, what is a money market instrument? It's test question, high quality debt, maturing, in uh, less than 12 months, like uh, bankers, uh, negotiable jumbo CDs. Negotiable meaning if there's a secondary uh, market, jumbo means over a hundred. And that's the only one that's not issued at a discount. Only one that's not issued at a discount. A uh, banker's acceptance, stupid but testable. They just seem to test on banker's acceptances all the time. But uh, banker's acceptances, which are used to facilitate foreign trade. If 
facilitate. Foreign trade. Oh boy, I'm struggling here. Facilitate. Uh, foreign trade. And they too are issued a discount. And they have a 270 day max maturity. Uh, commercial paper is again a uh, large unsecured borrowing by corporations and very testable. Uh, unsecured borrowing by corporations. And it too is issued a discount. And it too has a 270 day max maturity. Uh, generate income, that's why you buy bonds. The coupon value, remember the coupon value is important because the coupon can be expressed as a lot of different ways, right? The coupon can be expressed on the bond as the nominal yield. It can also be expressed as the uh, fixed or stated rate of return. And then remember the important thing is what you've got to be able to do is when you see on your exam like a 6% bond, be able to know, okay, well, that's 6% is based on par. That's when the bond was issued. And so that 6% is par is a thousand in a bond, very testable. And so what you got to know is this bond would pay $60 in annual interest, for example. If it was 8%, it would be $80 in annual interest. Uh, you should definitely know that par is 100, 100% 100 of par, which is a thousand. You should definitely know uh, on the bond, you should definitely know current yield. I wouldn't worry about yield to maturity and yield to call, but I would be able to kind of place them in relationship to each other. You know, so, so the ones to know are current yield, you should definitely be able to crunch current yield. And then uh, know where yield to maturity and yield to call are in relationship to that. Don't get, again, don't try and turn yourself into a bond guru. But, uh, ratings, I would definitely know uh, standard and pours is the one they use on the test. And I would definitely know that under standard and pours, below triple B is less than investment grade. Be careful. I just had a guy, RTFQ, read the full question. He passed today. That was his hashtag. So triple B is investment grade. Less than that, that standard pours is less than investment grade. Now we never say on the test junk because one man's junk is another man's treasure. And you know, all issuers are gonna reserve the right to call the bonds away, replace high cost debt with low cost debt. And so call risk is associated with a declining interest rate environment. Again, this isn't a bond lecture. I have a two hour lecture on bonds. Explication is about intellectual inventory just going through the test of lunch issues and seeing where you intellectually own. I highly recommend you print out this PDF and have it while you're studying and try and put check marks next to it saying, okay, I think I got this, or this is something I need more work on, for example. The call risk is associated with a declining interest uh, rate environment. And, uh, you know, there's two bonds we'd have with no call risk. The uh, two call uh, bonds that have no call risk because they're not callable are zero coupon bonds and treasuries. And then, you know, there's two things that prevent the issuer from calling the bonds. That's called call protection. And call protection consists of two things, uh, time and price. Uh, I would definitely know... Uh, that long-term bonds are more volatile than short-term bonds. So long-term bonds are more volatile. 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 
Um, I'm struggling with spelling, but who cares? Long-term bronze are more volatile than the short-term. You know, you just pick that out of the lineup, basically, on your exam. They say, which one of these has higher volatility? And you would say, you know, go shop the answer set and pick the 20 or 15, whatever's the longest-term bond. Uh, we should definitely know there's an inverse relationship between interest rates and bond prices. I always joke, if you want to sound smart and somebody asks you about uh, economics or finance or investments and you want to sound smart, you would say it has a lot to do with interest rates. And if you just shut up, you'll sound good. You say, well, what about them? They say, you say they fluctuate. So uh, we have a negotiated uh, underwritings in the primary market in a negotiated underwriting, in a negotiated underwriting, the issuer just selects the underwriter. And in a competitive, it's whoever provides the best deal, whatever syndicate or underwriters provide the best deal. Now in a bond, the best deal, I wouldn't get into the weeds on this, but Stock, the most money for the stock and a bond, whoever provides the lowest net interest cost, I wouldn't worry about, but the lowest financing is what that amounts to. And you know, another way we can do a competitive deal is to uh, have an auction. For example, treasury securities are done with auctions. So we just put it out to uh, bid and auction and see who gives us the most money. Uh, again, I wouldn't has it, uh, be too uh, hung up on options for SIE. There's maybe two or three, and I have a two hour lecture on that. You know, my recommendation would be, depending on where you're heading after your SIE, if you're, you know, heading towards a seven top off, then all the time you spend laying the base knowledge in your SIE is going to be uh, productive. Where in your SIE, if you're heading off to a series six top off, maybe not, maybe not. But, you know, I always tell people in this exam, and again, this is not a lecture, there's about 10 hours of options lectures, there's about two for SIEs, uh, if you want to take advantage of those on the channel. Uh, but the most important thing on this exam is this answer set. You know, that you can look at the answer set I'm putting up here. And at some point, you know, a long call is a choice to buy. You know, the short call is an obligation to sell. You know, a long put is a choice to sell the stock. And D, a short put is an obligation to buy the stock. So what you really wanna work on the SIE is those that answer set. We have two types of contracts, calls and puts. You can either buy them or sell them. And so we have four basic option positions. And that's what I'm telling you that I would be a concern with as a test taker is those uh, four basic option positions. Now, again, there's six strategies you're held accountable for. And those six strategies can be deployed on equities where the underlying interest is a stock or where the underlying interest is an index. You know, uh, index options would be used to speculate on the index or hedge a entire portfolio. And those are the two players we have. We have people who are speculating and people who are hedging. People who are hedging have stock positions. So if you're hedging with an option, that means you have a stock position and you're trying to lay off the risk. You're either doing a protective put or a covered call. You know, hedging is a stock uh, plus options. You know, and remember the two positions you can have is long stock or short stock. And then, you know, the uh, speculative ones are where you just have one of those option positions. You just have one of those. Expiration, very testable, is 11.59 uh, p.m. Eastern time on the third Friday, uh, third Friday of expiry month. I would definitely know that. You know, the strike price is where I may either have a choice or where I have an obligation. So an Apple 125 call. And then the premium is what you're gonna pay or receive because you're either gonna be doing an opening purchase if you're buying the option. So on that premium, you're gonna be doing an opening purchase to go long. That means you're gonna pay the premium. Again, this isn't an option lecture, this is a explication. 
or you're going to be doing an opening sale. That is an answer set on the test to go short. And again, I have that uh, in the options lecture for you. So, you know, this, I'm not sure I'll put this in the SIE playlist. I might create a separate playlist for content explication, but, you know, but you'll find it and, you know, you can line it up with the lectures that are for that spot. Go short. And that means you're going to receive the premium. You're a potential victim. Uh, you know, underlying is equity options. So when you're trading options uh, with stocks, so equity options, you have to deliver the underlying. So if you're short a call and I exercise, you got to come up with the stock. Whoop. Let me get a different color here. So if I uh, exercise you a delivery of the stock. And in index options, it's just cash settlement. So I, nobody would play with you if what I had to deliver was, you know, a hundred shares of 500 stocks, nobody would do that. So index options are cash settlement. You know, you, the person who's short, just come up with the uh, cash value of that. Index options, exercise, settlement is cash. Index options. It's the intrinsic value. You know, in the money and uh, is synonymous with intrinsic value. We had a couple great things there. Call up, call up. Calls are in the money when the market price is up from the strike price or put down. Puts have intrinsic value when it's a uh, market price is down. Again, I'm not lecturing here. I'm just going through the explications. The one you want to worry about here, a guaranteed test question, is an uncovered call, uncovered or a naked call. And that's going to subject you to unlimited risk. Uh, we have two styles of exercise. We have American, which means you can exercise anytime. And that's typical of equity options. And we have European style where you can only exercise at expiration. And that's typical of non-equity options. And I would know that, I would know that. I mean, you're only gonna get two or three options, but anything you can get that is just memory work, you probably wanna do that. Uh, exercise and assignment, varying strategy, going long or short. Uh, the options disclosure document is testable. That's the thing that tells you, you know, all the bad things that can happen to you, characteristics and risks of options. And I give that to you before account approval. And then once I get your account approval, I give you the, the, the disclosure document. Then I go get your account approved, and then it's got to be back within 15 days of the option agreement, saying that you read that and you understood it within 15 days of account approval. And if you don't get that back to us, you're only going to be allowed to do closing trans transactions. Get rid of the stuff you got. Uh, in options, you don't have contraparty risk. And the reason you don't have contraparty risk is because the OCC, the Options Clearing Corporation, is task question, the issuer and guarantor of all options. So you don't have to worry about where somebody to deliver the stock to you. Uh, you're gonna get uh, tormented on the distinction between closed end funds, which trades in the secondary market supply and demand. Very testable. Supply and demand in the secondary market. And I know you're tired of me telling you I have a lecture for that on mutual funds. It's spot on and you just watch it. You'll be in good shape. And open in where we're continually offering uh, new shares to the public. So that means every share is a new share, right? So. 
doing business directly with, with that. I haven't had anybody tell me they've seen, you know, any question about UITs, but UITs are uh, passively managed. So the assets are professionally selected, but then they don't, it isn't managed. Professionally selected and passively matched. I wouldn't worry about that on the test. They're selected, passive management. And uh, variable annuities, I would know are considered to be non-qualified retirement plans. The non-qualified uh, variable contracts or annuities are funded with after-tax money. And so these are considered to be non-qualified retirement plans. Non-qualified meaning you're uh, funding it with uh, after-tax money. You know, I think of it as a mutual fund with an insurance wrapper. So after-tax money is what funds that. Money you've already paid taxes on, you can get it when you're 59 and a half. Uh, you must start drawing down at 72. And it's gonna be, if you do random withdrawals, it's gonna be LIFO, last money's in, our first money's out. And uh, if you annuitize, turn it into an income stream, which you can do, uh, some of that will be taxable, some of it's not. But it's growing tax deferred because uh, the variable account, the variable annuity, you're putting money in the separate account and that separate account is a mutual fund. And so you are subject to investment risk. You know, maybe one question on variable annuity, so I, I wouldn't get too hung up on that on your SIE. The annuitant assumes the investment risk of that separate account. And now what the test is concerned with is misuse of no load terminology. So whether you buy an A share or a B share or a C share, you know, there's whether it's contingent deferred sales load or not, you know, you can't misrepresent that. And what they're really concerned about the misrepresentation of is 12B1 fees. You know, 12B1 fees are promotional expenses paid by a mutual fund. And uh, you need to know that uh, if you want to refer to yourself as a no load fund, you can't have a 12B1 fee more than 0.25% uh, that's one quarter of 1%. That's called a basis point. If you want to sound like a, a player, you'd say 25 pips. And if that's what you have 25 basis points or less, you can still refer to the fund as no load. Still refer to the fund as no load. If you go past that, then you can't refer to the fund as no load. And in no circumstances, can you have a 12B1 fee that exceeds three quarters of 1%? And that'd be 75 BIPs or 0.75% or 75, by the way, I should probably fix that. Uh -huh. Or 75 basis points. Uh, costs and fees, I would know that the most you can actually uh, have as a as a, an NAV test question has to be calculated every day. And uh, we're always doing business based on the next calculation of that. That's called very testable forward pricing. So I never really know how many shares you're gonna get because we're always doing it based on the next calculation of the NAV. Uh, what are the costs and fees of the mutual fund? Well, the largest single expense of the mutual fund is the investment advisory fee. There are others, but that's the one I'd be aware of. Uh, definitely no, a break point is a quiet discount. That's a good thing. Quiet discounts are good. So I can't tell you how many students get hung up on this. That is a good thing, why discounts like uh, Costco, right? I don't need two tons of salsa, but it's so cheap. And that's good. Now be careful because we have a breakpoint sale and that's bad. And that's when you try and avoid the breakpoint to maximize your commission. Big no-no. Uh, so you uh, probably want to fill out a letter of intent, a letter of intent, you know, with rights of accumulation. I say, listen, if you invest, I'll just make up a number. 
$100,000 or more, the fund's going to charge you 3% instead of 4%. You say, well, Dean, there's no way I'm coming up with that money. So there's no sense in me filling that out. I said, well, you think you might come home or with your, within your lifetime? So with rights of accumulation, uh, you're not going to get a uh, breakpoint on your initial investment. But when you finally do cross the breakpoint on that and all subsequent investments, you would get that reduced sales charge. Now, the easiest way to stay out of trouble with this, because this is a violation, not only FINRA, it's also you know, state administrators, to make sure you don't get in trouble is to tell the people how they get the best deal. What is the way to get the best deal? And one way we can do that is with a letter of intent. A letter of intent is good for 13 months, test question. If you'll tell the mutual fund that you plan on coming up with, in my example, it was $100,000. So you give me 80,000, I say, do you think over the next 13 months, you might be able to come up with this? Let's fill out a letter of intent. They'll give you that coin discount on your initial investment. So you're good thing for you, you can't uh, be hurt. If you forget this thing can be backdated 90 days, that 90 days is inclusive of that 13 months. Uh, and no investment clubs, investment clubs are not allowed to pool their purchases for purposes of meeting the breakpoint. no breakpoints for investment clubs. Uh, sales charge, the uh, maximum sales charge for a mutual fund, I would know is eight and a half percent. It's called a full service fund. <laughs> Listen, if the uh, Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board says it's a municipal security, well, then it's a municipal security. And so I would know that uh, 529 plans uh, are either savings plans or prepaid tuitions. And if it's a municipal security, they say, now what you gotta be able to do on your exam this comes up quite a bit on the exam, is be able to contrast a 529 with a Coverdell. And the biggest contrasting point that they like to test on is that there is no phase in of deductibility. It's not means tested. So, you know, if you have a customer in a very high tax bracket, this is probably going to be uh, better than a Coverdell because Coverdells, there's limits and there's phase in and so it's just easier. Uh, on ABLE accounts, you know, uh, the onset of disability age. Again, uh, I look at a lot of debrief that uh, disability for eligibility. Uh, I haven't had anybody tell me on 529 they've seen anything about local government investment pools, but uh, local government investment pools are money market funds for cities and counties and school districts to pool their uh, money that they need to make, you know, pay the firemen and the policemen and the teachers. It's the equivalent of a municipal money market fund is what a LGIP is. Again, it's a municipal security. So uh, we've talked about some municipal fund securities. I uh, want to be clear who the owner of the 529 is and who the beneficiary is. You know, the owner controls the account, they can give it to other people. Uh, some states have tax advantages uh, associated with a 529. So it'd be important in terms of suitability to know what, the, what those, that is. And uh, sometimes you can come directly from the state. I'm coming to you from Nevada. We have a Nevada 529 that has advantages over the ones managed by Vanguard. Or you can get this perhaps from your uh, advisor. Direct participation programs, maybe two questions, not high risk, but in a limited partnership, the limited partners provide the money and the general partner provides the experience. So LPs provide the capital. And these are forms, uh, you can have tenants in common, who cares? But the main thing, let's see if we have it here, is the flow through. I'm just seeing if we have it, there we go. So that's the main test question. If you own a direct participation program, the partnership is not going to be a taxable entity. It's going to pass through the profits and losses to the partners. You're going to get a K-1, and that goes on to your, uh, your tax return in an area called passive. Very testable. You can't get in or out of a partnership without permission of the uh, general partner. So these are not liquid. That's very much a test issue. You shouldn't put anybody into one of these things that needs their money to be investments. Now you buy a REIT for the same reason you would buy a mutual fund, professional management, diversification, ease of ownership, but you would be buying that as in a diversified portfolio. 
of real estate. And we have REITs, real estate investment trusts that are private. We have uh, REITs that are registered and trade on New York or NASDAQ. And we also have ones that are registered with the SEC, but uh, don't trade. Uh, these have to pass through 90% of their net investment income, just like a uh, mutual fund. And how do you make money in real estate with equity or debt, equity or debt? And that will flow through you. So you get tax advantage, right? Because usually if you had real estate elsewhere, like in a corporate shell, pay taxes, pay your dividend, pay taxes, so flow through. I'm going pretty quick because I'm a little over an hour. I'm trying to keep these explications within the hour so that they fit into a study block. So, and remember, we're not trying to, you know, lecture here. We're just trying to give you a quick intellectual inventory of what you're held accountable for. Uh, hedge funds, the one thing hedge funds don't do is hedge. And hedge funds were organized as private partnerships, private partnerships. So they can only be sold to accredited investors. And we talked earlier about what an accredited investor is, very testable. And hedge funds have large minimum investments. You know, I saw one guy, his minimum investment was $50 million with a five-year lockup. And these two are very, very illiquid because you can't get in or out again without the permission. And we have uh, not only hedge funds that are organized as private partnerships, we have uh, also uh, private equity funds, uh, venture capital funds, and like any partnership, again, very illiquid. Uh, ETFs are on the test. ETFs are on the test. And what you have to be able to do is contrast an ETF with a mutual fund. You know, there are things that people don't like about mutual funds. And so ETFs, exchange traded funds are secondary, trade in the secondary market. So they trade supply and demand. You don't have to do this forward pricing thing. They are marginable. Open end funds are not marginable. That means you can sell them short. They are more tax efficient because they're not for test purposes being actively managed. So that's another advantage, more tax efficient. And uh, ETNs, uh, test question, are debt instruments. And this is where the sponsor just agrees to uh, pay you against some benchmark. And then again, you would be at risk that uh, maybe they can or can't uh, do that, right? So uh, that's the test question, by the way. If you buy an ETN exchange traded note, you know, the sponsor, for example, I could buy a $100,000 ETN, Marco goes up 36%, you know, five years, they owe me 136 grand. And I have the risk that they can't pay that. So debt instrument, the owner is a creditor. So you have a creditor relationship with the sponsor. Uh, and uh, the sponsor is typically a financial institution. And boy, I've seen a lot of these uh, blow up. So that's why they're on the test. Alternative investments, uh, fee considerations, the fees and, you know, these hedge funds, private equity funds, venture capital funds is typically 2% of the assets under management and 20% of the profits. And as you can see, that is substantially larger than what a typical uh, mutual fund would, uh, uh, you know, charge you. Uh, definition of uh, risk. I'm just seeing where we're at in this thing. I'm trying to make this work. work. Yay. Okay. So I'm going to come in a little over an hour. Again, tell me where you find this, uh, you know, okay or not. I mean, in terms of it's helpful. Somebody told me it is helpful. So as long as people find it helpful, uh, we will continue on with these explications. Uh, but capital risk is losing your money. Very uh, testable. Credit risk is associated. Uh, let's put that in there. Primarily, there's two risks when you buy a bond credit risk and interest rate risk. And this is the risk of default. And test question here is you're gonna have a greater risk of default if the bond is uh, less than investment grade. Uh, currency risk, very testable. Uh, that's for an ADR, remember, because they're, they're a foreign security. So you have currency risk. I, in lecture, use telephone was to Mexico, but that would be an ADR or any uh, foreign security in a foreign market. Inflationary purchasing power is associated Stocks, common stocks are a good hedge. Let's put that as a test question. So if a customer is afraid about inflationary purchasing power risk, common stocks are good. And fixed, invest, and fixed income investment vehicles are bad. Uh, interest rate risk, we already talked about that, very important. You know, inverse relationship, we talked about that, very testable.
interest rates go up, bonds go down. Uh, liquidity risk is uh, partnerships. You know, we should never put somebody in a partnership if they need liquidity. Uh, market risk or systematic risk, the tendency of securities prices to move together. And uh, the way we say that sometimes on the test is that even if you're properly diversified, risk prevails despite your diversification. Whoop. Risk prevails despite diversification. A uh, non-systematic risk, very testable. Non-systematic risk is also known as selection risk. And the easiest way to avoid that is to diversify. You know, Bernard Baruch said money is kind of like mowing manure, you got to spread it down. So this is known as selection risk, picking the wrong thing. The easiest way to avoid it, test question. TQ means test question. Doesn't mean you're going to exactly get that test question, but somewhere around there, you know, diversify is the easiest way to take care of that. You know, and uh, the easy way for most people to do that is a mutual fund. Uh, political risk. You know, you invest uh, your money in a country and, you know, they don't uh, pay you back. They, you know, they default. Uh, prepayment risk is associated with declining interest rate environment. You know, those mortgage securities we talked about, if interest rates go down, everybody refinances. So that's associated with declining interest rate environment. And that's also call risk. Uh, we call those mortgage pass-throughs, as well as call risk. It's not quite the same, but you know, close enough for an explication. Uh, strategies, we said diversification is a guaranteed test question. And remember we said that one takes care of uh, non-systematic or selection risk. I would definitely know that takes care of non-systematic or selection risk. Very testable. I don't have any draw. You're not going to get asked that. You can rebalance your portfolio based on your asset allocation. Uh, you can hedge. You know, so what you can do is you can hedge using, for example, index options. You could buy uh, puts on the index, and as the portfolio goes down, the puts on the index become uh, more valuable. So you can hedge. Uh, using index options would be one to, way to uh, hedge that. You could try and find things that have negative correlation. That's a little beyond the series uh, SIE, but you know something that goes the opposite way. So, okay, well, listen, um, it looks like I'm going to come in on explication two at a little over uh, uh, an hour, which was my goal. So I apologize I'm going fast. Um. If any of these things I've explicated has gone too quick for you, remember you have a pause button. You also in the comment box, I'm pretty good at returning any kind of a question. So if you, uh, two things, let me know if you find this productive because that's what will lead to me doing this on section three. If nobody says they find it useful, I probably won't do section three and at some point I'll hit the delete on the, you know, the two that are up. But I did have somebody said they found this SIE candidates who found this attractive. So. Uh, let me know. And then, like I say, second thing on the comment box, if I have gone too quick or I went through something and you say, well, gee, Dean, well, you skipped over that. Why? And I say it's not on the test or, you know, it's low probability. Feel free to put that in there as well. Any question you may have. Now I'm going to put this uh, up for a premiere. And just so you know, SIE candidates, I doubt any other candidates be watching it, but we have field any questions. During the live premieres, I run a live chat alongside the premiere. So if you attend the premiere, you'll see the explication, but you'll also uh, be able to participate in live chat with any questions you have either about the lecture, the SCIE or any other thing that you might have. Okay, so uh, I hope you found it productive and we'll do a uh, section three next. And uh, you know, like I say, I'm interested in your feedback on this because I, again, this is something new, something that uh, somebody had recommended. So I'm you know, if you have any ideas about how to make it better or, or you know, whatever, let me know. Let me know. Uh, I'll talk to you later.